So, um, hello everybody. Thanks to uh, join so early uh, to listen to me. That's yeah, surprise. Um, First of all, who am I? My name is Luca Pizzaniglio. I'm an Italian guy um, working at Trivago. I'm a FreeBSD enthusiast. Um, I use FreeBSD at least for 10 years now, uh, and I received my port commit bit uh, in August 2017. Uh, what I'm doing usually is trying to look for new uh, use cases for FreeBSD. I really believe FreeBSD is a very solid uh, platform and can run basically everything. Uh, specifically in Trivago, I built packages, uh, customized stuff, and so on. Um, a note, it's, it's early, Sunday. Uh, I had the ability to provide gadgets. We have socks. So every time you have a question, you receive a socks. So the first 10, que uh, first ten questions, uh, so don't, don't be uh, afraid, is speak out. Uh, make this presentation more interactive. Uh, help me. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's only for me out, uh, also. So, this is for today. Uh, we'll talk a bit about JSON pod, what pod is, uh, something I presented two years ago here. Um, what is a service mesh, or what I believe the service mesh is. Um, what is a pod image, future work, and then your question. The pod framework is something I started uh, more than two years ago, actually. The ambitious goal was to, uh, basically it was, yeah, there was there is no Docker, we know, uh, on FreeBSD, at least not natively, uh, and, but actually is a really nice pattern, uh, or at least something that is quite easy to use. Uh, but in FreeBSD there was actually no container model in general. So say, why don't you try to do something similar using all the technologies that are already available, like ZFS, uh, JL, PF, Finet, RCTL, CPU set, and so on. Uh, so I came out with this framework as a set of, uh, basically it's a tool that allows you to manage JLs, um, data set, I would say, pretty easily uh, now. At that time, it was quite rough. Um, uh, but yeah, that was the logo at that time, so pot comes from a pot no, is not the other meaning of pot. This is someone else suggested. Um, and that, that was basically the state at the time. Um, and how that fit in here. I mean, who does know what a service mesh is? Or use? Wow. So you have to, I have to explain the best of my capabilities, what a service mesh is. Uh, a service mesh in general is an abstraction um, where a developer here can submit basically a, a job or uh, uh, then we'll see what, what a job is to this very big black box cloudy thing and then the user can just use um, the service that is exposed by, by, by this job. Um, I will go a little bit in detail. This is not like, I mean, it's similar to Kubernetes, but it's not Kubernetes. Um, so basically, the developer has a job description where it specifies um, which container to use um, and which port should be exposed, uh, which type of services is that, and so on. Here we have a uh, central point, in this case, uh, the orchestrator. It received this job description, and they say, OK, you want these containers uh, up and running. It looks for the, in the worker cluster, so we'll basically transfer the, um, allocate, or orchestrate basically the execution of these uh, containers to the workers. The workers will download the container images. Uh, there will be spawn basically those new containers. Uh, the service will be up and running, and that is one side of the story. Then if it's a network service, you have a um, service discovery something, a server, basically, we use console here. 
Um, and what the orchestrator does will register your service here and say, okay, uh, now I, I decided that your service is running on this machine, uh, exposing uh, the port, I mean, it's running on ports one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Uh, so this information are registered now here. So, um, this, so uh, the discovery, uh, the service discovery will know, okay, there is this service with this name that is running there. And what it's also doing is continuously checking uh, if the service is up and running, so the health status of this, uh, of this service. And this is the so-called control plane. So now, theoretically, if you want to reach the service, I mean, the orchestrator decides where the service is running, so you don't know exactly where it is. So you have to basically interrogate the, the service discovery. Uh, and this is called, I guess, the con um, control path. So basically, you can, so you can know basically where your services are running. Uh, and you have another element, it's called, uh, is a, a proxy or a layer seven uh, load balancer. This load balancer or this proxy, um, you can configure it basically to say, okay, or when there is a user that wants something, uh, look for uh, where this service is running. So basically the, the list of the backend is continually updated uh, to know where all the services are running. So it's say, oh, you want this service? Boom, I reroute basically all the traffic to the proper node, but they get the information here. And every time there is a new service that is, um, uh, if the same service is replaced, so the old container got destroyed and a new container is running, for instance, here, the information is updated in the service discovery, and so the, the proxy can get updated information and reroute the traffic in a different direction. I hope I explained myself. I'm not really a super master of this all elements. Any question? Cool. It gets... <laughs> uh, uh, it, it does not seem uh, a PSB uh, upset to me because uh, images, uh, nomad, console, and there are products names. Uh, so let, let to repeat the question. Uh, the, this doesn't seem uh, FreeBSD things to me. Yeah, that, of course, that is what's the problem. Um, actually, those are programs that run everywhere. They are mainly, I guess, all of those are Go. Uh, programs. Um, yeah, that's actually the point. Uh, how can we have something like this on FreeBSD? And that is the solution that I'm presenting now. Uh, as you see, the, the, the real issue is this container images. There is normally um, no such solution uh, that has used these names. Um, and exactly that was what is really needed. Uh, the features that was really missing was the ability to deal with images, so the creating and all of the images. So you need to create and export an image. You need a image registry. I mean, imitating Docker, okay, you have to create a Docker container. You need Docker Hub and then uh, the ability to download and uh, then import an image. That was the set of features that uh, we worked on. Um, but more importantly, what is really different is the, is the paradigm, how you work with those kind of, I mean, the workflow is really different. We are used to create J's on, directly on the machine, and then you configure them and you let them running. Uh, and the developer will just, I don't know, just give you uh, I don't know, the PHP code or the Java code, whatever is running there, but you are directly uh, managing J's on your final machine. Uh, so the paradigm here is different. Someone is working on the image creation, so in the EJL image, and someone else is deploying it. <laughs> so the paradigm is very, very different. Uh, and also how uh, the set of tools that you need is different. Uh, it was it's an almost unexplored area, I'd say, and um, sorry. I will discuss before the deployment of the jail on available nodes, so to make that feasible, and then we'll discuss about the how to create an image and all, all those things. Um, there is already a lot of complexity all around. I mean, a lot of new names, new components, things that are going there and there. 
Um, so the first implementation of pot as basically a, a jail was composed by multiple data set. There was the base, there was mounted in read only and shared with other data uh, jails and so on. Uh, for this kind of scenario, when you have those moving parts, it was too complicated. So I decided, okay, just go to um, uh, one single big ZFS data set where I put everything there. So it's easier than to create images uh, how I, I export a pot. Basically, you create a pot, basically a jail, uh, you customize it, you put the software that you want, you take a snapshot, and then with ZFS send and compress tool, boom, you create an image. So basically what you want inside your, your jail. Uh, and then you have a file, a file is easy to, to move. Uh, to import a pot, well, uh, is the other way around. So you this implies that only ZFS can be used. Uh, the question is, only ZFS is used? Yes, ZFS is mandatory. Okay. Uh, I don't support other thing. If you, <laughs> uh, if you want to use a different, uh, please support a patch. Uh, I mean, submit a patch, and we're happy to to extend support. But uh, I mean, ZFS. I mean, the whole pot framework is heavily based on ZFS because uh, I have all the nice feature uh, snapshot, uh, rollback, and you know. Everything's there. Uh, so to import uh, a pod, so basically when you download a file, then you can just uh, uh, nope. uh, uncompress ZFS receive. Boom, you have the same basically content somewhere else. And then you can uh, clone the snapshot. Um, I use the clone here because if you have one image, then it's, uh, if you have, you know, this, this image is reused. Imagine an Nginx server and you have the same Nginx with different configuration. It's easier than to clone it and just change the configuration file than to untar again and do a ZFS receive. So that's basically is a slight uh, short optimization. Questions so far? Other questions? The question was if I try to use uh, Beehive. Uh, no, because it means completely the point. <laughs> uh, I mean, Jails is very, very uh, light. Beehive is not that, that light. I mean, Beehive makes sense when you have different operating systems uh, that you want to run on, on a FreeBSD host. If you have the same operating system, use Jail. I mean, I want to pro um, I'm focus on uh, native support. I mean, it has to be native. It's really faster. If you have Beehive, you don't have the same performance because it's a full virtualization. With Jail, you have uh, a light virtualization. So it's just the operating system side. So. Um, I'm waiting for your patch uh, <laughs> on that topic. Um, so why? We choose Nomad um, to try to implement this uh, service mesh uh, dinosaur. Nomad the console are, say, FreeBSD friendly in the sense that they are already in the package system. So you can just install Nomad and console and run and have them up and running. Um, so console is the service discovery and Nomad is the orchestrator, basically. Uh, moreover, Nomad has an internal structure that allows to add additional driver. And a driver is something uh, that is basically supporting uh, a different type of containers. So there is a driver for Docker container, a driver for, they call it uh, this Java thing, means that basically you have a jar tarball and then it's executing the JVM right away. Uh, so different types of uh, containers. Uh, and what happened here is, uh, why can we not write uh, an additional driver to let Nomad interact with Pot? Uh, so, Esteban, that I see here, is present. Uh, a colleague of mine just developed the driver. I mean, tried to create this bridge between Nomad and the Pot framework to interact with Jails. Uh, so the driver is already available. You can install it on your own. So it's uh, I would say mature product, but stable enough. Um, and this is the job description. 
I will go through that a little bit. Uh, this is a very <coughs> easy example, even if it's very long. Um, you have on top the name of the job, the job uh, is, is a, it's a service. Then you have the concept of group because a service can be composed by different containers, so you want to join them to provide a service. Uh, in this case, the group is called example group, like a fantasy, uh, and it's composed by only one task, that it's only uh, Nginx part. And here you specify the driver, saying the driver is pot, then Nomad will look for uh, a worker that supports pot and <coughs> will able to uh, execute the jail in that way. Uh, I will just jump here. This is the, the part that was strictly part of the driver. So basically you say in the configuration where to download your image. You say the name of the image, the version. The command is basically is mm, optional, uh, but it's the, um, the entry point of your jail. What is the first command that's to be executed when uh, the jail is, is spawned? Um, then we have here, that's the service part. So that is the, all the information that you give to, to Nomad to spawn the jail. And this part, the service, is what to register to console. Um, the name of the server will be web example, for instance. And then you see this port HTTP, port HTTP, port HTTP here. It means that the port 80 in the container will be mapped with a different uh, port outside. Uh, there is uh, an automatic uh, PF redirection rule that is injected to the node. Uh, and this new information will be registered in the service. So we will see in console there will a different port so locally the, the jail, we have an Nginx running on port 80, but then you have a PF rule that makes the redirection. Uh, and in console, you will discover basically where uh, this thing is running. Questions so far? Yeah. So this is like the port, the port registry <coughs> uh, to output this. Um, I mean, I, I always didn't understand what is actually in the port registry. Yeah, uh, the pot registry, uh, there is a slide later. I mean, the question was about uh, what is this pot registry? Is a web server with files. Uh, there is one slide uh, exactly on that topic. Um, it's complicated. Um, it's all the second part of the, uh, was about that. Um, it seems easy, but it's not easy, I mean, if you think, why I'm not using uh, IO Cage or other jail frameworks that are out there? Uh, first of all, because I can do my own. <laughs> uh, it's open source, so you can do whatever you want. Now, being serious, it was, it doesn't work. Uh, there are features, I mean, a container has something different from a, diff uh, a normal jail. For instance, this comment in, um, in Nginx, Nginx is not fork, forking in background. What it means, means that uh, if you use that type of command with jail, with the jail command line, the jail command line won't return because the first command is basically executed by the jail command and it's just keeping your, it's um, yeah, still your, your shell. It's not returning. If jail has this standard assumption that the common, the, the, the exact start of the common that you gave, basically at a certain point will fork and will return. Uh, in this case, it's not the case. I mean, usually containers are working with blocking commands. So basically they keep, um, Nginx is spawning and they're serving directly web traffic, period. It's not forking. And that it creates a series of issues. Um, in this case, for instance, the post start, post start hooks are not executed at all because what the jail command is doing is just working with like create the container, spawn the commands, wait it is over, and then executing everything that is after the post start. The post start is never reached because the command is keeping, basically is not returning. Uh, and a nice thing that is nice, yeah, it took me some time to discover is um, usually those containers are ephemeral, means that if the process inside the container disappear, the container disappear itself. Uh, J's are by default persistent, so if there is no processes there, the J will, will stay. And IOKH, for instance, only support persistent uh, J's. Uh, 
the no persistent parameter is also applied by jail start as a post start hook. And it didn't work, basically. I have to find some uh, weird way to be able to have this no persistent flag applied even when a comma that doesn't return. Um, last but not least, these not clean up themselves. You know that there is the post um, stop hooks or the pre stop hooks and so on. Uh, if you have a not persistent jail, uh, you mount your uh, devices, you create your PF rules, then the jail disappears. Come on, you have to clean up. But you don't have any notification uh, that the jail disappeared, or you don't have any way to register a callback. What you do usually when you call jail minus R, that is the jail stop, uh, is the command that is executing those hooks. So say, okay, I, uh, the command says I have to stop this jail, so I run the hooks, I stop the jail, and then I run the other hook. Uh, but if it's not persistent, the jail will just vanish. And there is no centralized daemon, basically, that c is controlling that what happened with the jails. They are just, it's an internal file syst um, operating system structure that just, it's like when a process is going away, it, you don't get any notification per se. Uh, we solve this, basically, inside Nomad. If Nomad has to control that the containers are up and running, if it's not running, it's just calling a pod stop and it clean up, basically, uh, almost everything. Uh, that way, but we don't have generically a way to um, to clean up not persistent jail. Question so far? It's clear and too fast. Can you repeat the question? Can you run? Uh, Um, you have to avoid, uh, the question was if you can run something that doesn't demonize. You have to change your command line no, to no, avoid no, that is demonizing. Oh, no, uh, so ye Before yes, you can. can. Run other services that uh, so the best practice in this world is to have one process per container. Okay. So for instance, we have a, a Redis instance uh, and the exporter, that is just basically uh, another program, is running in a different container. Uh, because if one container dies, you just replace this and you don't replace the whole service, basically. There are, is a common best practice in this way. Technically, you can. It's suggested not to do it. But yeah, you can put more. Uh, you can create your own script and spawn different stuff. The point is that the last one shouldn't return. Uh, yeah. Network. Um, currently, we support two um, network configuration. One is the so-called host, meaning in, in jail jargon is inherit. So basically, you are you're using this, uh, the the machine network stack. Or the other one is the public bridge, meaning that you have an internal bridge. Uh, every jail has a VNet, its own stack. It receives one IP uh, and is exported outside. Uh, there is a NAS that is showing everything and um, you have redirection rule for every service that you want to expose. And those are supported both in pod and in nomad. In pod we had also other two uh, network type configuration. One is the private bridge that basically works exactly like the public bridge. So basically we have one bridge and you attach your uh, J's there. But the public bridge is one for all of them. With private bridge, you can have a bridge only for a subset of J's. So I have three J's, I want them isolated. So they, uh, you can have dedicated bridges just for those type of, uh, yeah, for, for your work. We want to add this to Nomad as well. So it makes sense, for instance, for a group, you have three different uh, J's. You, want them, you, want, you don't want them to be on the same unique bridge uh, for many reasons. Uh, currently, we have a small issue because the driver works at the task level, but the bridge works at the group level. So it's one, it's one abstraction level above. And apparently on uh, Nomad 010, there is this ability to have something at that level, so we have to figure it out. I mean, currently, it's already working with the public bridge, but if you put, I don't know, 200 jails, uh, then this bridge will be overloaded and probably the performance degraded. So uh, this is an area where 
we want to improve. The last type is alias. Uh, this is the typical jail uh, way of doing things. So basically you assign a static IP to your jail and that will be an alias on your network card. In this dynamic uh, cloudy environment, it doesn't really fit well uh, because you have, I mean, you can theoretically have this jail that is moving from one node to the other and this IP will follow. Uh, but it means that you can only have one instance of that of that container, you cannot have multiple. Uh, I mean, this cloudy thing is designed to provide you horizontal scalability. So if you need more uh, horsepower, then you have instead of three web servers, five web servers, 10 web servers. And in this case, we are limited to one because there is only one IP that you can assign. Uh, so, and also when you do, um, when you want to spawn, um, I don't know, you want to respawn the same, uh, the same, I don't know, there is a new version of, of the web server, so you have to uh, redeploy your job. Well, you have to remove the former job, redeploy someone else, and then you have uh, a small downtime between those two, those two times. So I don't know if it's really something we want to pursue. Um, I'm still undecided. Can you use it? Can you play with it? Can you try it? Yes. Uh, there is a lot of different tools that probably nobody knows uh, or you don't know. Uh, the configuration, it can be a little bit tricky. So, um, Michael Gremli just uh, suggested, well, why you don't do a mini pod that is basically mini cube? So kind of an instance that is run on one node so you can play with it. Uh, so there is, uh, there it is. Uh, Minipod is basically a service mesh. Uh, what I described before, all these console, nomad, traffic, components, everything. This is running on a single node. So you can install Minipod as a, uh, as a package. Uh, there is um, one script that will change some configuration file on your machine. And then you can start it and you have the same environment on, a, on your machine. So you can, it's not for production. Not at all, because you don't have high availability and for tolerance, of course, it's running only on your machine. Uh, but anyone can try, so if you want to give a spot, this is the way. There is um, a readme page with the instruction how to uh, install it. It's not for production. <laughs> <laughs> it is not clear, it really, it's not for production. <laughs> Questions so far? Don't be shy. I still have five socks. So. Wanna see a demo? Yeah. You sure? <laughs> <coughs> we see. Uh, so this is how Minipot looks like. I have Minipot running basically on my uh, on my laptop. Um, and what you have, you have uh, Console running on port 8500. 8, you have Nomad running here. And you have traffic. This is the front end. Actually, we won't use it, but um, it's here. So how it works, where it is, for uh, example, host one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm. I'll So this is a job description file. Um, for a mini pod, you specify a data center just to know where can be spawned, but there are internal abstraction uh, of abstraction. Uh, it's, that's the very, the very hello world example. So basically just define a service called hello host them. Uh, the configuration is Nginx, I mean the standard Nginx, so we'll be, we will see the, the, the standard page of Nginx, uh, where to download the image, uh, which one, which version, blah, 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 and the port 80 will be uh, mapped up uh, to outside. And that's it, that is the minimum thing that we need. So how it works is that we just say nomad run awesome.job. Command line tool is now uh, speaking basically with the 
uh, with the server, say, hey, this is the job description. Oh, the resources. So the question was about the so resource limitation. Um, yeah, I missed that point. So basically, I'm using CPU set, so that it's complicated. Uh, theoretically, the, the resources that you specify are used by the orchestrator to understand if your cluster has the capability to run this kind of uh, job. Um, so c the CPU is kind of a bogus megahertz. Uh, so if your machine has is running on two gigahertz and you say that your job needs 100 megahertz, it's basically, okay, your machine is two megahertz and then it's using like to say 5%, something like that, but it's, it's bogus somehow and it's used mainly for, uh, for uh, scheduling and orchestrating. Memory is, I'm using RCTL to enforce memory, uh, but it doesn't work like in C groups. RCTL is try to, to limit the amount of memory used by your jail, but if your jail needs more memory, it won't kill your, um, uh, your processes. And that is not ideal in general because then you can have people exploiting the threat. So you can use basically more memory, invading the others. Uh, it had this neighbor effect, so called. Um, one thing that we have to work on is uh, OM killer. So basically trying to monitor the memory consumption as it's really not able to stick to that value, you have to kill it. But those are resources that are uh, with RCTL and CPU set basically, they are enforced. Um, I said now, yeah, we have the, Submitted the job, triggered, created, blah, blah, blah. What that means, we just look now at the, uh, at the UI here. So ta -da. we have our post and job one up and running. Um, and you see there was only one instance. Uh, it's running where? is running here. That is basically where it's reachable. Just click on it. And then there is the welcome to Nginx. We have the same information here. Basically the, the, the service is registered. We will have also some tag because then you can basically subscribe to specific service that has this tag and so on. Um, and what you have here, you have also basically now console is keeping this information up to date. So you know, he knows where it's running. You see there is not 4080, but this weird number. Um, and then it's performing continuously uh, checks. So if that disappeared, that would be marked as red. And basically you can ask to console, okay, give me all the services and give me uh, the service that are in health sta in healthy and not, uh, not running. So this, it's trying to keep this information always up to date. Uh, and then you have also here, basically um, this is traffic, this is the, this, this proxy. It receives the information from console and it had that here, a new front end called uh, Hello Fosden because that was the name of the service. And if you basically occur with this host header, it will be redirected to the backend Hello Fosden that is here. Uh, and those are totally dynamic. So basically continually asking console, oh, there is a new service, is adding a new front end and is adding then a new backend to, service to serve this, uh, uh, this service. I see that I have I have to run, I have another demo, but uh, yeah, I don't have time to, to show it. Um, it seems nice, seems working, but what is the problem? Creating the image is actually an issue. I mean, what is the image? How can I create it? How can I provision my jail? Uh, we need to provide automation Reproducibility, that is a, a heavy topic for me. Has to be fast. The images should be not gigabytes, but reasonably uh, small. 
the solution should be portable and usable. Portability, especially because the current solution is basically forever. So uh, when you run a pot create to create a pot, uh, you can specify flavors that are basically provision scripts. So you can say, okay, if you want Nginx, boom, I have a script that just install Nginx. I make Nginx an example, but, uh, and then you can have basically multiple flavors that do just a uh, small set of operations. For instance, those, uh, there are two flavors out of the box, FBSD update and Slim. FBSD update is running at FBSD update before anything, so it's, because when, uh, how it works when you say, okay, this is the base 12.1, is downloaded the base uh, .txz, but that doesn't have any uh, fetches. So you always have to run a, a previously update there. Uh, and this limb is a work in progress. Um, it's tried to reduce the image of the, uh, the size of the image, deleting CLang, deleting uh, a lot of files that if you're running web server, you don't need. You don't need GDB, you don't need a lot of things. So and just removing hundreds of megabytes of, uh, of stuff that's in that scenario you don't really need. Uh, two problems. First, uh, first of all, it's not user friendly. Scripts uh, go, and it's not really user friendly. Uh, it works obviously only on FreeBSD. What is a shell script that uses JS? It works only on FreeBSD. Web developers use, they don't use FreeBSD, period. Said, I have a FreeBSD, uh, I'm the only one in Tobago, we have a thousand people, I'm the only one with a FreeBSD laptop. Uh, nobody's, I mean, nobody. Few people use FreeBSD on, on the laptop, so it's, it's, a, it's an issue. Um, and the other thing that is not really nice, if you, let's say, oh, new version of Nginx, you have to recreate everything from, from the scratch. So you have, you keep your flavors there, basically those boot script, but then you have to create everything from, from the beginning. This is still an issue. The second one is not that bad. Can be better. Um, pot machine. Esteban, again. Uh, why you don't imitate Docker with Docker machine? So basically, if you want to run a Docker container on a Mac, uh, I mean, Docker I mean, inside Docker, there is Linux binaries. But they run on a Mac, and how it works. Basically, uh, what you have is and uh, you have to install Docker machine that is installing a, a Linux kernel in a virtual box or in a VM, sequentially, and it's executing Linux code there. So why can we not do the same? Uh, and Pot Machine is this project to create, basically it works on Mac OS X and on Linux. We use Vagrant to spawn a FreeBSD uh, VM where you can execute and run your JS. It extends all the commands available on pods. So basically you have two or three commands more and every command that is not special kind of, you have pot machine, pot build, I mean two or three commands. Uh, the other are just forwarded to the FreeBSD VM and you can have your JS running on Linux more or less. So that's, it's, a, it's an important thing because it's breaking the, the barrier. So everyone can theoretically now play with JS. You don't need a FreeBSD installation to play with JS. The second work in progress is pod file. This is, we are just looking how it goes. So we're trying to imitate Docker file. Instead of having that complicated scripts that you put there and there, uh, you can just have this typical run from whatever. It is experimental. Uh, it's not adding really or changing the way, it's just translating this pod file in, in a flavor. I mean, the flavor is what actually you want to run. It's the same. It's not user friendly, so there's basically a wrapper uh, where people is more used to, to use uh, to create pot images. Uh, I would encourage you to, to try it. If you have some issues, he will fix them. <laughs> uh, but I say it's a work in progress, so we are still evaluating. We don't want to create a complete new format because I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I mean, also Dockerfile is not the best format ever. So we are kind of puzzled what we can do, what we shouldn't do. Registry. Uh, 
easy. It's HTTP server with those files you put there. So when you do a post export, you create your image, and then you have those files. Copy them over, period. Uh, you have to maintain your own registry, basically. Uh, I don't want to maintain any registry at all. Uh, I don't like the idea to download binaries. I don't want to maintain, uh, to have the burden uh, in terms of security, with having binaries floating there and there. Uh, but I'll be more than happy to have uh, a flavors catalog. So you need Nginx, okay, this is the way to create Nginx. So you have those scripts already prepared. Uh, there's a very approach similar to what Bastille BSD is doing. They have all these templates where you can just say, okay, I want a jail with memcache. Boom, done. You don't need really to understand how it's already there. Uh, so there you have a really uh, a great approach and uh, maybe I can reuse those templates. I don't know, I have to speak with the uh, Bastille BSD developer. Uh, this kind of registry that I showed in uh, the examples, it's a virtual machine running somewhere, is a web server with those two files, period. It's good for examples, so you don't have to create your own and so on, but it's not for production use, not at all. It basically, it's just something so people can try it. You can try it, you don't need to create a new image uh, and so on. Uh, but it's not Docker Hub, you cannot upload things, it's, as I say, it's a web server. Is not for production. Wow, two minutes, three minutes. Uh, we have want to do a lot of things. Um, many have already spoken, but I am running out of time. Uh, we want to focus now on more on image creation because that is where people can then uh, use it or at least try to use it. Because if you have, wow, you have your service mesh, but you have nothing to run, doesn't make any sense. Um, so this is more or less, especially with Pod, we have many ideas, but no time to, to do it. Um, the DualSec support will come. I get, uh, no, it's not here, Olivier, spoken with him. Uh, good idea to have IPv6 support. Currently, everything is uh, on IPv4, uh, but we, c we will have IPv6 support to provide dual stack, so your container can, can will speak IPv6. Uh, really thank you to be here, thank you for listening. Uh, I will thank also my contributors. Uh, I put nickname because I'm not sure that they want to be, I can write their name, uh, but really thanks. Uh, question. Wow, many. <laughs> oh. And there's another one, what? I'm almost over. Uh, but I guess I have time for many, how many questions can I? Uh, yeah. I mean, I will. Uh, do you have any ideas about persistent storage? Uh, it's relatively easy. Uh, it's not managed here. Basically, you can go on the machine, you can mount data sets or directories inside the, inside the container. So uh, it's up to you what to use. But if you have on a specific node, you can pin basically a container running on a specific node where you have a data center, your persistent storage there, and then you can mount it uh, inside the inside the gel. It's a feature I didn't show, but it's, it's there. And you can define that this container, this jail has. Yeah, you that. specify mount in. Mm -hmm. You can mount in, uh, uh, as I said, a folder or ZFS data set uh, in read only, if it has to be read only only, and then you can pin the, the job directly to a specific machine. Uh, I don't see why not. Uh, I use PF. I don't know how your cage is using PF. I only think I'm, uh, what he's doing is he's using uh, two anchors that I add, and that's it. So I don't really <coughs> pollute too much. Uh, and then I have my specific data set uh, under, you specify where to put your root, mm -hmm. where to create all the data sets, and if it's different, then it should be compatible. I never tried it, but. <coughs> Keep me posted. Okay. Last question. Paul. So how would you compare that with the uh, uh, software of your project, like uh, Container or Lambda? Yeah. What is the software that you are showing? 